been my, my good fortune now for some 16 years to serve in the Senate with Senator Dick Luger and to come to know him and his wife, Shar, and more importantly, uh, to come to know their work together on behalf of Indiana and the United States. Dick Luger is truly a giant in the United States Senate. We're going to miss him. Hello, I'm Senator Dick Durbin. Welcome to my Capitol Report, A Different View. And today we're going to take a view from the Midwest on the world with a colleague of mine who'll be retiring very shortly, Dick Luger of Indiana. Dick, it's good to be with you today. Thank you, Dick. Great to be your guest. Well, you know, Governor Adley Stevenson once said that those of us who grew up in the Midwest, Indiana, Illinois, living in all that flat land, had a different perspective as we looked out on the world. He was right. He was, <laughs> and you certainly have. I look back at your boyhood. You grew up in Indianapolis yes. or nearby, yes. right? Indianapolis. Well, what did your folks do? What was that all of? What was that like? My dad uh, was a farmer. He was a Purdue graduate in agriculture, and uh, I spent a lot of time, as did my brother Tom, a year younger, out on the farm pulling volunteer corn out of the soybean fields. But, uh, uh. It's a farm that I still have managed for the family for the last 50 years with 604 acres of corn and soybeans and hardwood trees. So that was here in his background. And my mother uh, was the daughter of a, a pioneer in the food manufacturing business. Uh, the Thomas O. Green Company made uh, cookie and cracker production machinery with band ovens and cutting machines and what have you. And so this was an enterprise with a high school uh, diploma that he founded and sold these machines all over the world. So it was a wonderful view of the world from two perspectives. Farming and business. Yes. And you found time, in addition to going to school, for the Boy Scouts, and literally yes, the Eagle Scouts. Well, that was very important. In those days, you had to be 12 years old, and my scoutmaster-to-be came by to visit with my parents, a very serious oh. endeavor about all the responsibilities and what was going to be involved. But it was a very good troop, and of course, troops often depend upon the quality of the adult leadership and its follow-through. But I had a great experience in Brown County, the rural Indiana County, that in those days uh, had only running water, I think, on some occasions. <laughs> there were no lights that I can recall. So it was really a camping experience, to say the least. And you moved up the ranks to the highest rank in the Scouts, Eagle Scout. Yes, yes. Then a distinguished Eagle, and to cap all this, my lovely wife, Char, found all the merit badges, uh, got them onto the, the <laughs> sash so we could put it in our office with various other uh, Eagle Scout distinctions. How many things. merit badges did you have? Well, I just 21. Now, I think they're more required these days, but yeah. those days, 21, and then we had an examination on all of those with the Eagle Corps oh, review. Sure. Yeah. Really had to reenact my life-saving merit badge again, uh, you know, <laughs> in the pool there at the Indianapolis Athletic Club. And, run the dashes and all of this sort of thing. And we're taking nothing for granted. I wanted to do it by the time I got out of high, grade school because I figured high school was going to be another chapter and that turned out to be a good strategy. Your strategy beyond high school was to go to Denison University in Grand, Ohio. Granville, Ohio. Granville, Ohio. Uh, hmm. I remember Tony Hall from the House of Representatives yes. was your graduate was and was also an All-American football player and Denison was known in his day as the I guess one of the last colleges with the single wing football formation. Yes. Yes. Well, that's true. And we had Woody Hayes as our coach at Denison for a while. He moved over to Ohio State uh, to a much more noted or notorious <laughs> situation, <laughs> as, depending on. But Denison, uh, folks in the stands would be, have their radios on listening to Woody in Ohio State. But <laughs> it was not a minor sport, but nevertheless, it had its place. But the big, <laughs> big news at Denison is when you were not just elected president, but co-president yes, of co -president. the student body, yes. and a young co-ed named Charlene, yes. whom you came to call Char, yes. was your co-president, and pretty soon more than that, right? Well, that was the most important <laughs> election I was ever involved in. <laughs> it was a very progressive school, an election of a man and a woman, and then the two elected by the total student body came together as co-presidents. And so I, without telling tales out of school, would just say that uh, Char had told uh, some classmates that uh, she was not about to be pushed around by some pushy man. I said, me? I say, but I realized diplomacy. 
was. Uh, Ah, uh, your first part. test of diplomacy. Exactly. How did that work out with when this I Charlene? I took her down to the coffee shop in <laughs> downtown Granville, and uh, thus a romance ensued. Uh, at the time, I had given my fraternity pin to a younger woman. She had accepted a fraternity pin from an older man. Oh, oh. <clears throat> but uh, these two, sadly enough, uh, disappeared from our <laughs> lives. And, uh, we've been married 56 years. 56 years. And have had just a, a wonderful time with our four sons, now our 13 grandchildren. It's a, a great life. So off you are uh, in the farming business and, and growing some trees and yes. a little business work and somebody says, Dick Luker, why don't you run for mayor of Indianapolis? Well, it, it came about that when I was out at the factory trying to save this family business because my dad had passed away prematurely. My brother was a Purdue engineer. I was just simply a liberal arts type, politics, philosophy, economics. But nevertheless, the two of us managed to turn this thing around, begin to make some money, and it was largely through exports. Uh, in Mexico, and Venezuela, finally the Philippines. So it was quite an interesting situation. <clears throat> but um, people on the west side of Indianapolis, pardon me, <clears throat> the industrial side of, of the city, came to the factory one day <clears throat> and said, Luger, you've got to run for the school board. We're just getting dirt. Our kids are, are never treated right, and somebody's got to stand up for us. Now, mind you, I was 31 years of age. Uh, I was trying to keep a struggling factory going out there, <clears throat> totally unaware of even where the school board met, quite apart from exactly what they did. But nevertheless, uh, the urgency of this was apparent, and Char, always a good conscience, said, you know, our boys will be going into public schools very soon. Maybe this is something we will look at. So I got into it. I didn't realize the civil rights revolution was just commencing at that point. All sorts of candidates came into the field, and <clears throat> made a long story short, I was elected in sort of an at-large situation and got into one controversy after another, starting with school breakfast. The Chamber of Commerce said, we've never accepted a dime in this town from the federal government, and we're not about to start now because you've got some ridiculous idea about breakfast for <laughs> latchkey children or something of this sort. But nevertheless, I, I prevailed. The children got the breakfast. And then we, so was this one of your first radical ideas, breakfast for oh, kids at it, school? It was just off the charts. You didn't have this news editorialized. And <laughs> we're still, I began to think about peaceful desegregation of the public schools, which is even more of a reach, yeah. and adopted the so-called short-reach plan, named after the high school I had attended, that uh, that was now 90% African American, 10% Caucasian. When I was there, it was 100% Caucasian. So in any event, uh, we, we adopted a situation that any child all over the, the city could come to Shortridge for a college preparatory situation. Uh, no boundaries, no nothing. So the first freshman year, the miracle happened, 50% Caucasian, 50% African American, like water going uphill. The educational journals all over the country noted it. But it was too good to be true. <laughs> uh, more post conservative members came onto the school board and uh, said, uh, We're just for education. We're not sociologists and we're not involved in race relations. So, so rapidly things deteriorated again, and Indianapolis went the way of most cities. Mm -hmm. A desegregation order ultimately in the federal court, busing of children, and all the rest. But for, a, for a while, there were some golden moments in which uh, people really thought about education, uh, thought uh, really about justice and equality likewise. So after all that, was running for mayor a relief from the school board? Well, I would never have thought about running for mayor if I had not been involved in all of this, nor would anyone else have thought about my running for mayor. Mm -hmm. But the, the controversies were so enormous. No Republican had won in Indianapolis for over 20 years and uh, unlikely ever to do so again given the demographics at the time. But the Republicans uh, decided this would be an interesting <laughs> candidacy. And uh, so I won barely over the incumbent mayor. And thus began the idea of UNIGOV, the idea we were going to have the city and the surrounding county, Marion County, in one city with one mayor, one council, and all the wealth uh, of uh, and uh, so that, of course, was quite a controversy, to say the least. <laughs> of all the things you've done, Dick Luger, that's the one that just absolutely astounds me. When I think of Illinois loaded with all forms of government yes. 
I, I can't even tell you all the different forms of government. I think we may lead the nation. When you threaten one of those forms of government, boy, you are in yeah. for the battle royal. But you managed in Indianapolis to basically combine a county into yes. a single form of and government. And therefore, we came up into one of the largest ten cities in the country. Suddenly, we had a, a huge pouring of investment to come in. This was the beginning of professional sports in a big way. Yeah. That uh, we were really on the map. And um, at the same time, however, uh, just using the sort of data we all look at here and now, uh, about 35% of the public, if asked, do you approve of Dick Luger <laughs> or disapprove? <laughs> about the 35 on the disapprove didn't change for Never changed. most of the time. Very, so, very unhappy. <laughs> I want to ask you a couple uh, Indianapolis-related questions uh, that are just kind of curious what comes to your mind. Uh, First, what the heck's a Hoosier, Dick Luger? Can you tell us on the record, what's a Hoosier? No, I can't tell you. <laughs> no one knows. You know, no, well, you've been asking that question probably for 50 <laughs> years. The, the old adage, however, that sort of fits is that the, the settler uh, heard a knocking at the door and he said, Hoosier. <laughs> that's as close as it gets. Yes, that's, that's okay. close. <laughs> so now let me ask you, what, what is your, uh, when you think about the movie Hoosiers, mm -hmm. about that famous little yes. basketball team that yes. won the state championship playing yes. the big school. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, our former member in Congress from Indiana was playing on the big school team, Hamilton, wasn't yes. he? Lee Hamilton yes. yeah. played on the team, the little school won. What is your impression or memory of that, uh, if oh, you have I, one? I remember all of it vividly, and of course the film was just a knockout. It was Because great. it was, Butter Field House is where, uh, I was a short reach high school player, not a very good one, uh, but that's where we played the sectionals, and then they had the regionals, the semifinals, and the finals, all there. So that, a very historic situation. And furthermore, Milan, which was the small town that had this team, was just the epitome of what Hoosier basketball was all about. Namely, in those days you had 700 high schools. They all entered a tournament. Uh, and uh, so you went through the 64 sectionals and the regionals and semifinals. And at the end of the day, and the idea was always the hope that a giant killer would come along. <laughs> we have know. the same stories in <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> Nowadays, um, and it may be for good reason, but educational authorities have decided that um, Perhaps uh, self-enhancement is more important for children than all this business of Hoosier basketball. Yeah. So we have four classifications. Yeah, it's it's all segmented. Same. And unfortunately, the attendance at many gyms is pretty low yeah. uh, and the interest of, of the fans. 